morning. This is the March 26th meeting of the Board of Directors of the Golden Rain Foundation of Walnut Creek. Welcome to the first ever online GRF board meeting. Please bear with us. There will be some glitches as we've seen, but we will get better. The staff has worked nonstop getting us ready to conduct online meetings. Thank you, Deborah, Joe, Lisa, and all the staff who've worked so hard. It's a difficult time for all of us. I hope you're able to get outside and enjoy spring in Rossmore. If you can't, open the windows and let spring in. Please sign up for Nixle. This is the most immediate communication system we have in Rossmore. It is critical to communicate to all residents as quickly as possible. Urge all of your friends, neighbors, and concerned relatives to sign up. You'll find a Nixel sign up link at the bottom of the homepage at rossmore.com. Please keep an eye out for your neighbors, especially those that are frail and don't have and those who don't have family close by. Give them a call or knock on their door. Just make sure you stand six feet back. Make sure they're okay. There's no better time than now to strengthen our community connections. The work order desk is still answering calls for urgent repair needs, but it may take longer than normal for someone to pick up. Watch channel 28 for informational shows featuring our CEO and local health experts answering questions or the new fitness classes by Kathy Steen, a GRF employee. If you know a healthcare worker, please thank them. Be safe. And Deborah, will you go over one more time the process for uh, logging in for attendees or uh, making their comments and then call the roll, please. Certainly. All right. All right, so uh, for the attendees, if you can draw your attention to the presentation, please. I want to review the control panel. This is a wonderful place uh, to communicate with the board today. Audio settings are simply that. You can adjust your audio to listen. You have a chat feature to speak among yourselves. The raise hand feature is available, however, for today's meeting for all resident forum questions. We will hold a single resident forum at the beginning of the meeting. Please type in your first last name, your address, and your question, and a moderator, Lisa Liu, will let you know uh, that uh, you will have a chance to speak. When you are live, if she unmutes you, you will have three minutes to speak. If you need to leave the meeting, note that once you hit this button, you will exit the webinar, and you will need to re-log in to re-enter the meeting. Okay, and roll call today, please. Kelso. Here. Birdsall. Here. Coonan. Here. Neff. Here. Adams. Sue Adams. Here. Great. Anderson. Here. Brown. Here. Harrington. Here. Stumfell? Here. Okay. Okay, uh, everyone has read the minutes. Are there any uh, changes or corrections? Raise your hand if there are. Seeing none, they're approved as written. Uh, Mary, the treasurer's report, please. Okay, this is gonna be a little longer than I normally do. But before I give my report, I want to recognize the efforts of so many of the GRF staff members during these very unsettling times. <clears throat> it has taken extraordinary effort to implement all the needed changes required by social distancing and at the same time keep the operation running. Thank you to Ann Peterson and her staff for the excellent communication on breaking news and in the newspaper and on Channel 28. And thanks to all those involved in training and the infrastructure support to implement Zoom in record time. Deborah, Lisa, Lou, and Tim have been so patient teaching us how to make it all work. I also learned that the mutuals are conducting meetings using Zoom. And apparently mutual three under Kelly's guidance and training had a successful board meeting yesterday using Zoom. <clears throat> and yesterday I had to work on an alteration permit Offices were closed, but I made contact and was able to get the permit in the right hand 
and to the right people via scanning an email. So thank you, Lucy. I could go on for another 10 minutes, but probably it's time to focus more on the financial reports. My message is that as we all know, Rossmore is a very special community. No doubt we have challenges in front of us, but with such dedicated staff support and so many incredibly smart and resilient residents, including all the retired epidemiologists, EPO volunteers and clubs, including the Companion Club. I think we can get through these trying times and make the necessary adjustments in spite of being a high risk population. <clears throat> and with that, I'm going to start my report. This is likely the most positive treasures report that you will hear over the next few months, so enjoy it. I'll start with, regular month, with the regular monthly report. Then there will be a special update on financial considerations based on the impact of the coronavirus. In February, the operating results were $93,000 favorable to budget. Total revenues were 55,000 more than the budget and total expenses were under budget by 38,000. Cumulative for the first two months of the year, there is a net surplus to budget of $134,000. The revenue and expense variances are detailed in the treasurer's report in the board package and in the Rossmore News. February results in the trust estate fund were as follows. There were 28 membership fees generating $280,000 as compared to 23 in 2019 that generated $207,000. Cumulative for the first two months of the year, GR have collected 56 membership fees, generating revenue of $560,000. The five-year average collected for the two months totals 65, which is nine more than this year. So we are below the five-year average, but above last year's collections. Total trust fund expenditures for February were $225,000, the major expenses were $33,000 for machinery and equipment and $178,000 for debt service. The year end cash balance in the fund is $4,105,000. And before I go on to the next segment, I wanna make sure people are hearing me. Is everything okay? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay, without the audience out there and looking around, it's hard to know. <clears throat> So now I'm um, going to move to a more recent update on the financials based on the last through three weeks. Coronavirus has and will impact GRF finances, and we don't know how long. Normally, board members would have attended a GRF finance meeting last Tuesday to hear about potential concerns and possible actions that need to be taken. But holding a meeting in public was out of the question. Health and safety are our first priority. We hope to have the finance committee up and running on Zoom very soon so that we can resume the meetings and board members and residents can hear the conversation. So in place of the finance committee meeting, uh, CFO Rick Chekhov and I are going to provide a financial update. I'm going to begin and Rick will follow. At the end, we will answer questions from board members. I will first give an overview of the trust estate fund and follow that by discussing the operating budget. I'll focus on major revenue streams and expenses plus the cash on hand. I'll point out items that are certain and those that are uncertain. And I'll also mention some concerns and actions that need to be completed. So starting with the trust fund, we have two major revenue streams. The first is the membership fee, the $10,000 paid when a new member purchases a manor. This is an uncertain revenue stream. The Finance Committee forecasts the revenue based on past years. The forecast for 2020 at this time is 420 fees and $4.2 million in revenue. But we anticipate that the current financial turmoil was, will disrupt the real estate market. Plus, as of this week, realtors are no longer allowed to show houses. And for those purchases in escrow, the process is slow because the workers can't perform their jobs. We don't know how long it will last before the market recovers. So the second revenue stream in the trust fund is the John Muir Medical Center lease. 
Lease revenue is about $700,000 a year. This is a certain revenue stream for 2020. But we know John Muir is vacating the building and the lease payments will end in January 2021. So we must factor that into our long-term plan. And the other potential revenue that we were hoping for this year would be the result of either selling or leasing the John Muir building. And just three weeks ago, we thought we had it nailed <clears throat> and how quickly the world has changed. So as of today, we do not have a buyer and new lessee for the building. And given the financial turmoil, it is uncertain when a transaction will occur. So that is a risk that we must factor in. I wanna take a look now at the major trust expenses. They fall into two categories. The first is debt service of three GRF loans. This is a certain expense that totals about $2 million a year and it must be paid. The second category is capital projects. They entail annual upkeep, such as pool heaters and road construction. In addition, the expense includes major discretionary projects like those approved at last month's GRF meeting. Some projects are currently underway. Others have not yet started. More work must be done, done to identify what has not been started. A preliminary estimate is that about $2.3 million has not yet been committed. Now I wanna to turn to some good news. And that is the cash on hand in the trust estate fund. GRF has about $4.1 million cash on hand. The cash includes a $2 million emergency reserve fund approved by the board last year. And I wanna compliment the board and the finance committee on being such good stewards and setting aside that reserve fund. I didn't think it would be used on a pandemic emergency but thank goodness we have it. The emergency fund ensures GRF can make the required debt payments. The remaining 2.1 million of cash on hand is likely already committed to specific projects such as creek repair. More work must be done to confirm the total committed funds. So here's a concern and an action item relevant to today's meeting. In January, the finance committee communicated there was $1,177,000 available to spend on capital projects. That number assumed that 420 NTF fees would be collected in 2020. Based on the funds available, GRF approved projects totaling $1,143,000, all but 34,000 of the available funds projected by the Finance Committee. I am fairly certain that if the Finance Committee had met Tuesday, they would have appeared today with a recommendation that the board pause and review the capital spending plan based on all of the financial uncertainty caused by this pandemic. I would agree with that recommendation. Now I wanna to turn to the operating budget. So in the operating budget, we have two major revenue streams. The first is the coupon paid by the mutuals. This is a certain revenue stream that totals about $24 million. It's the $293.60 a month per manor charged to mutuals. If an owner defaults, the mutual still pays. But the $24 million coupon revenue does not cover the total operating expense. What is required is an additional revenue stream and that category is called other revenue. It generates about $3 million a year under normal circumstances. It includes revenue from golf, the pro shop, media advertising, recreation, the crease side lease, handyman, et cetera. The amenities close, with amenities close, GRF will have reduced operating revenue. Media revenue may go down due to the negative business culture. Work needs to be done to predict how much other revenue may be lost and what can be done to offset that loss. Now let's review the major operating expenses. They include items like employee salaries and expenses, taxes, insurance, utilities, contractual services, and pension funding. 
Funding the pension is uncertain and may cost more than budgeted. Let me briefly explain a bit about the pension. First of all, this discussion is not about the asset allocation in the pension. I'm on the pension committee and I am confident it is well managed and well invested. Board members received a copy of the February pension committee minutes. There was a 23% return on investment in 2019. We need to remember that the plan is invested for the long term. Eventually the market will recover as it did during 2008 recession. But with the recent decrease in the stock market, the total pension plan value has decreased. And as an aside, the pension plan retiree payments are made from a stable value fund. So we are not taking money from the stock accounts now. So GRF funds the pension plan annually. It is a budgeted expense. When the value of the plan is high, less funding is required. When the value goes down, then more funding is required. Funding requirements are based on the value of the fund at the end of the year. Since GRF has overfunded the plan for the past few years, that will be applied as a credit to what is required for 2020, at the end of 2020. And during the last recession, the government loosened the funding requirements for pensions, because as you can imagine, GRF is not the only organization with a pension. The message is to tag the pension plan funding as an uncertainty at this time. Like the trust estate fund, the cash on hand in the operating fund is good news. The target is to maintain a working capital fund of $1.5 million. The balance at the end of February was 2 million after paying most insurance premiums. To the extent operating expenses exceed revenues, the working fund can be used, but it will need to be built back up in the future. So a concern that we have here and that we all need to be aware of is how much revenue will be lost due to the closure of amenities and the depressed market conditions. To determine possible outcomes, the uh, plan is to do scenario work where we model the worst and the best cases and we assume how long amenities will be closed and what other things might happen. And so with that, I want to uh, turn this meeting report over to Rick Chekhov now, so he can describe some of the work that he's been doing the past few days. Rick, are you there? I'm here. Okay, it's all yours. Thanks. Um, so let me start with, with the operating budget first. As, as Mary mentioned, there, there's about $27 million roughly of, of revenue in the budget, about 85% or more of that is the coupon. The remainder are things that will be affected by being closed, um, like golf and fitness revenue. Um, what I'm working on is a month by month projection of how we would be affected. So if we came back online, let's say June 1st, July 1st, August 1st, you know, I'm using the budget as a tool for that and, and uh, trying to see what effect it will have overall. Um, in addition to that, though, there's there's expenses that will offset um, the the lost revenue. For example, um, if you know in the in the golf shop, for example, sells merchandise, there's a cost of sales. We won't incur the cost of sales because you haven't sold anything. Uh, similarly, there's a significant amount of revenue in excursions and ticketed events, but if you don't have them, you don't incur the expense. In addition to that, there are some items in the budget for trust maintenance that can pretty easily be um, deferred. For example, there's $250,000 in there for a slurry seal. We can certainly wait, hold off doing that until uh, next year, that won't be a problem. And as Mary mentioned, um, there's $2 million in cash roughly at the end of, uh, in operating cash in the end of the month, end of February. Our target is 1.5, so that leaves another $500,000 in addition to that, there's another $250,000 in, in a trust maintenance fund that's set aside. And the objective there was just basically to use that to, to smooth out trust maintenance going forward. So I think we're in a pretty good position in the operating fund. I don't see that being 
you know, it, it's not good news, but I, I think we we've, we've taken steps to try and mitigate any any problem that we might have. Um, wanted to mention the the pension expense for 2020 won't be affected by this. As, she, as Mary said, the the assets are measured once a year on on January 1st, so our contribution will be based on that. It remains to be seen what the uh, stock market is going to do through the end of the year. It's that's not something I'm going to try and predict. Um, so I think, as I said, we're we're making strides in in predicting what will happen in the operating fund, and I think it's it's going to be okay. On the uh, trust estate fund, Mary mentioned that, that it's totally unpredictable what's going to happen with with sales and and with the uh, membership fees. Um, if you were to look at the budgeted expenditure report we put out with the finance committee package, there's about oh I'm, I'm looking at it right now about 2.8 billion dollars that's that's projected to finish all the projects that are on the list, but many haven't been started yet. So there's, there's over $2 million of, of items there that could possibly be deferred uh, until later. And that, you know, that's something I'll work with the, the finance committee and the board on to see where that will go. But again, I think that's okay uh, for the time being. We will have enough money certainly to service our debt. So that's, Mary went, went into a lot of detail. I don't think I need to after that. It was a very good report. So if anybody has any questions, I'm here. Thank you guys, that was very thorough and I wanna congratulate the finance committee for their prescience and uh, suggesting this uh, reserve target amount that we have uh, that as Mary said, no one knew we would need any few months time, but I'm glad we have it. So are there any questions for Rick or Mary? Kathleen? Uh, uh, you said, Rick, that you're working on um, scenarios for back online in June, July, August. Uh, different, when will you be presenting those? <laughs> An outstanding question. Um, I, I would think we'll probably have a finance committee sometime um, in the not too distant future. That'd probably be the best time to do that. Uh, this is Mary. I, I want to, um, first of all, let everybody know that Rick has been working from home because he has to. He's one of those people, one of the uh, high risk people, I'll say, who, who's been grounded by the governor. Uh, the accounting staff <coughs> is running on a thread, people working from home. So I don't want to put a lot of pressure on the staff for perfection. Um, those of you who saw the work that was done on the long range plan, it was, a, it was not an end product immediately. So I'm viewing this scenario planning as a work in progress. And uh, so I think we'll be able to produce something. It won't be perfect. The beauty of having that finance committee and all those smart people is a lot of different people look at it. They have input. So it'll be iterative and uh, it'll get better over time. Thanks. Carl? I think that in these uncertain times, one of the problems with planning is factors keep changing. So in essence, I think it's important that we concentrate on the information we're going to need to make specific decisions. And like, uh, uh, salary budgeting and things like this, that it, that whole effort is going to be, pro, you know, we're, rather than try and come up with an, a, an exact plan and then have the world change out from under us, uh, I think it would be better that we focus, if, if at all possible, on information we need to make critical decisions over the next few months. That's an excellent point, Carl. I also want to remind everybody that uh, starting in June, we start thinking about the 2021 budget. So much work to be done. Any other questions? I see no hands. Well, thank you too. Uh, now, uh, Tim, the CEO's report. All right, good morning, board members, residents and staff. A lot has obviously happened in Rossmore and the world since the last CEO report a month ago. 
Um, as I think everybody knows by now, starting in late December, the novel coronavirus COVID-19 took hold across the globe and, and uh, really took, took hold in the, across the outside of China beginning at the end of February. The first cases were reported in Contra Costa in early March. As of yesterday, March 25th, there are now officially 108 cases in Contra Costa, more than 2,500 in California, more than 54,000 in the United States with more than 700 fatalities. Just in the week since I published the data from last Thursday in yesterday's paper, because we have about a week lead time to get information in the paper, uh, the uh, rate of infection in the United States has increased five-fold just in a week. Public health officials have said, have said that the figures will get dramatically worse with projections of millions of Americans getting infected in the coming months. I think as everybody knows, there's no cure and no vaccine. Eight days ago, seven counties in Northern California declared a public health emergency and issued a mandatory shelter in your place of residence public health order that continues through at least April 7th. As a result of the public health order and earlier recommendations from county and state health officials, GRF began limiting and eventually closing down its clubhouses and recreational amenities over the last three weeks. The public health order allows essential businesses to stay open provided social distancing is practiced and employees are encouraged to work from home to the extent possible. Therefore, much, much of the Golden Rain operations are exempt from the public health order, including the property management activities of the MOD and the mutuals. Given Governor Newsom's March 15th guidelines for persons over 65 to self-isolate, followed the next day by the county's uh, shelter at home order on March 17th, I'm gonna review the current steps we're taking in our various facilities and programs um, so I'm going to go through that list right now. So first, the facilities. All facilities are closed and locked. Gateway, the event center, Creekside, the fitness center, MOD, the Dollar, Clubhouse, Hillside, Clubhouse. All entertainment and programming is canceled through April 7th, and we're preparing to extend that deadline if we're directed by the public health officials. Currently, we have 22 employees over the age of 65 who have been asked to stay home. That's about 10% of our workforce. We have nearly 50 employees now who are working from home, with that number expected to increase. And that includes employees in the following departments, accounting, mutual board office, recreation, Rossmore News, counseling office, fitness center staff, and some of the employees in fitness, recreation, golf, and transportation have been placed on administrative leave. The Golden Rain Board has authorized the payment of wages through the end of the April 7th health order. Depending on what the county authorizes or orders at that point, the board will have to decide future actions after that date. For mutual operations, they are continuing to operate under the health order as an essential business, providing service to seniors in residential housing. Staff is practicing safe social distancing and using protective gear when necessary when servicing residential units. Before dispatching service personnel, <clears throat> the order desk is inquiring about the health status of residents to determine the level of risk for the resident and the staff. Non-essential or non-critical work is being postponed. All residents with issues requiring a maintenance response are urged to ensure a minimum safe social distance of six feet and to thoroughly sanitize before the workers arrive and after the workers leave. Golden Rain handymen are only responding to safety issues. For example, they're not responding to requests to hang pictures or build shelving because those are not safety hazards. And they're utilizing the same protocols that I just noted for MOD. The counseling office is um, not physically open, but the counselors are available by phone. They have been making phone appointments and service, providing service while working from their homes. The counselors are also proactively contacting at-risk residents to ensure they're safe with access to basic necessities. The bus service is operational, only one bus, uh, and it is available for on-call for non-emergency local transportation to Safeway, the pharmacy, and local medical appointments. The bus is limited to one to two people per trip, so you should expect long delays. There have not been a lot of people calling to ask to use the bus but I want people to know that it's available and we'll activate more buses if there is a need for that. 
Rossmore News and Channel 28 are both managing a very small staff on site. Several employees are working from home. Most news carriers are over the age of 65, so newspaper delivery is being handled mostly by other staff. You can uh, expect delays with the newspaper. Now, uh, a little over a year ago, we introduced our online e-edition of the newspaper. So on your personal computing device, whether that's a phone, a tablet, or your computer, you can access the online edition of the newspaper at www.rossmorenews, that's one word, dot com. If the newspaper operation or the newspaper printing is further disrupted, the web website will be our only method available to distribute the newspaper. Expect that future editions of the paper will have significantly reduced content since all club activities and recreational activities are on hold. <clears throat> Customer.com website. The breaking news section of the website is being regularly updated, sometimes multiple times per day. Uh, we encourage residents to frequently check the website for the latest guidance from the city, county, and public health officials as it relates to the Rushmore community. You can find that information by going to www.rossmore.com forward slash breaking. B R E A K I N G hyphen news, N E W S. Security. The front gate staff have been provided um, with directions to not let anyone in for golf, fitness, classes, clubs, etc., to verify that visitors are on guest lists before letting them in. Securitas has developed a protocol to get new residents their RFID stickers. During this time, however, Securitas will not be issuing RFID cards since minimum social distancing cannot be maintained. Securitas has adopted the county EMS protocols for social distancing for all emergency responses. Securitas will not be able to respond in person for non-essential service calls. Member records. The documents are delivered to the back door at Gateway with no personal contact. Materials are sanitized. Director signatures will be scheduled or delivered, then picked up. The realtors in California just this week announced that they it, there is a statewide closure of real estate offices, so there's no showings and no open houses. The alterations department is closed since there, the public health order does not allow new construction um, or renovation that has not already started under the public health order. Landscaping department continues to provide minimum service to keep from being overgrown and to remove hazards. The golf courses are both closed to golfers. Uh, they are open to walkers and limited maintenance will continue there. Fitness center is closed. The trainers are making calls to residents to check in and to provide fitness and well-being advice. The recycle yard is open for cardboard only and it's one resident at a time and the staff cannot assist. The restaurant said at Creekside Grill and Carrie's Kitchen at Gateway, they both closed over the March 14th weekend. Both operators are exploring how to roll out a pickup and delivery service with Creekside Grill beginning that service just yesterday. The mutuals are beginning to use virtual meetings. Yesterday, the first mutual held, um, or one mutual I should say, held its first meeting via the Zoom teleconferencing, the same service that we're using right now for you to watch this meeting. Uh, pay attention to the Rossmore News for information about your particular mutual and check your email from the messages from your mutual about when they will have their Zoom capabilities set up so that uh, the mutuals and committees continue, can continue to conduct business. The coupon. There's unlikely to be any savings to the coupon as a result of this disruption to Golden Rain and the mutual operations. Utilities will continue to be paid, maintenance services will continue to be provided. Essential functions are ongoing. Many of the amenities in Rossmore, especially golf and entertainment, are significantly funded by fee revenue, which is obviously discontinued. Any savings in one area will likely be offset by higher operating costs in other areas. At the end of the year, if there are any savings to the coupon, it will be returned to members in the form of a reduction in next year's coupon or a refund will be provided. Nixel, as uh, if you join this conference late, you heard the board president um, talk about Nixel 
If you have not already signed up for Nixle, it's absolutely critical that you sign up. That is our emergency alert system. It will be, if everything goes down, including the newspaper and Channel 28, it will be the, our only way to communicate with the community. Um, let's see. To sign up for Nixle, there's a couple of ways you can do that right now. One is to go to rossmore.com, scroll to the bottom of the page, and click the Nixle link. It's very simple. You can get a, a Nixle alert via your phone, your cell phone, your, your home phone, a text message, or an email, or all three. You can also call the phone number I'm going to provide to you. So if you have a pencil, write this down, and you can sign up for Nixle via the phone. That number is 925-988-7688. I'm going to take a few minutes here to go over uh, a list of questions that the board and I have been receiving over the last week and a half or so. And I'm going to also provide the answers. Question, where can I learn more about the impact of coronavirus and the public health order and how they affect Rossmore? Again, the best place to go is rossmore.com forward slash breaking hyphen news for information about Rossmore. And on that, at that location, you will also find links to many other resources, including official public health websites and links to other providers for food, medical services, and transportation. You'll also find on our website and on our YouTube channel, two excellent videos. We invited uh, Contra Costa Health Services Deputy Health Officer Dr. Rohan Radha Krishna to talk to Rossmore specifically about the coronavirus and its impact. Uh, he recorded one episode a week ago and he came back on Monday of this week and recorded a second episode. You can find both, as I noted, on the YouTube channel for Rossmore as well as on our website. Question, when will facilities be reopened? That's undetermined. It will occur when the public health officials allow us to reopen when the risk of the virus has significantly diminished. Question, I'm not feeling well, or I know someone who is not feeling well, what should I or they do? Golden Rain is not a health provider and can only relay what public health officials have already stated, which is self-isolate and call your health professional for recommendations. Question, I'm concerned about the staff, are they gonna lose their jobs? The Golden Rain Board has authorized payment for all staff to the end of the health order on April 7th. Following the next decision of the public uh, health officials, the board will have to determine uh, how to proceed from that point forward. There will be more information coming out on that as soon as we know more from the county. Question, <clears throat> since the facilities are shut down, can the coupon be reduced? The answer is probably not. As I noted earlier, most of your coupon is mutual expense and the services that both your mutual and GRF provide are mostly continuing. Utilities will keep getting paid, service and maintenance will continue, public safety is still being provided. The only areas that are completely shut down are the recreation department, golf, pools, and the fitness center, and much of those budgets are funded by fees. Since we'll not be receiving the fees to offset many of the continuing operating costs of those departments during the shutdown, any savings elsewhere in the budget will likely be absorbed by those costs. The staff, finance committees and boards of directors of Golden Rain Foundation and the mutuals will be monitoring the expenses closely and will be making adjustments as necessary over the coming weeks and months. Since Golden Rain and the mutuals are nonprofit corporations, if any surplus exists at the end of the year, it will be used as a reduction in the following year's coupon or it will be refunded. Question, if the virus breaks out in Rossmore, will GRF be quarantining residents? How would that work? Golden Rain does not have the legal authority to quarantine anyone. We're not a government. Any decision to quarantine someone will come from public health officials. Question, why isn't Golden Rain disallowing remodels in the manors? Golden Rain does not have the authority to restrict access to the mutuals or the manors, nor does Golden Rain have the authority to direct the mutuals to take action on any issue. The mutuals are separate independent corporations with their own boards of directors. Remodels are contracts between a resident and a private contractor. The resident and contractor have to follow the public health order like everybody else and make their own determination whether the work meets the requirements of an essential business. The public health order allows certain type of ongoing residential renovations to continue. It does not allow new construction or new renovations to get started. 
As a result, MOD's alterations desk is closed. Question, why are landscapers and others still working? The public health order allows essential operations to continue for housing, social services, and residential facilities for seniors. What is GRF doing for food and medicine delivery? We've been told by the government that that is their duty, not ours, to ensure that citizens have food and medicine. Residents should utilize delivery services for those items. The Golden Rain staff have put together an excellent resource guide for residents, and I'm going to give you a, a, an abbreviated website to shorten the website for you to get there, to find that list. You can find it on the breaking news portion of the website. And here's the link. I'm gonna give it to you again in, a, in an abbreviated uh, email link. It is HTTP as in Patrick, S as in Sam, colon, two forward slashes, tiny URL, that's spelled T-I-N-Y URL, dot com forward slash w a g a v is in victor w r if you type that you will find the resource list you'll get to an immediate jump to the resource list also city of walnut creek has a list of resources on their website if you go to the city of walnut creek's website and search for senior covid c o v i d resources you will be uh, taken to that particular list of resources that the city's made available to seniors. And lastly, later in this meeting, you'll hear of a new private food delivery service that would like to operate in Rossmore. Question, why can't Creekside Grill and Carrie's Kitchen develop a takeout and or delivery of meals business? As I noted earlier, Creekside Grill began takeout delivery yesterday. Carrie's Kitchen is working on the plans as well. Question, how can I get food and groceries delivered? For food deliveries from local restaurants, download apps like DoorDash or Grubhub. For groceries, you can go to Safeway.com or Instacart. Many restaurants in downtown Walnut Creek are also offering curbside pickup where residents can drive up and they will bring their food out to the car. You can find information on those on GRF's Breaking News webpage or the city's senior COVID resources websites. Question. What if I think someone is in violation of the county's public health order? GRF cannot enforce the order. We've been specifically told that the order is required to be enforced by the county sheriff and the local police department with the responsibility for ensuring the compliance with the order. If you're in Rossmore and you believe there's a violation of the order, you should call the Walnut Creek Police Department's non-emergency number, do not call 911, at 925-925. 943-5844. What is Nixle and why do I need it? As I noted earlier, if you haven't already, it's critical that you sign up for Nixle. It is our emergency alert system. If Channel 28, the website of Rossmore News goes down due to infections or quarantines, Nixle will be our only method of communication to the community. Again, go to rossmore.com, scroll to the bottom, click the Nixle link, or call 925-988. 7688 to sign up. I'd like residents to be aware that the availability of Golden Rain and mutual services can change in any time due to the imposition of new restrictions by public health officials or by an outbreak of COVID-19 among the staff. Checking the breaking news section of the website regularly for updates on the status of GRF and mutual operations and share this information with neighbors who you think are not using computers. These are, we know these are difficult and troubling times for everyone. Please understand that Golden Rain and the Mutuals are doing their very best to continue to provide limited services under very trying circumstances. Every program and every service that the Golden Rain Foundation and the Mutuals are providing is being completely redesigned and to be able to be delivered. The city, the county, and public health officials are doing their best to minimize the risk and limit the speed with which this virus can spread. It's absolutely imperative that residents and their family members and guests take very seriously the recommendations and directives coming from public health officials. The mortality rate for seniors and others at high risk of infection from this disease is extremely high. There's a lot of information out there, much of it is misleading, confusing, and conflicting about COVID-19, even from mainstream media. Please do not contribute to the spread of misinformation by circulating emails or unsubstantiated rumors. 
rely on factual information coming from the websites of public health officials and other reputable sources like research hospitals and scientific journals. At the bottom of the breaking news section of our website, you can find links to some of these resources. At some point, this will all end and we'll be able to get on with our lives. But right now, we are in the midst of this. So we all must be vigilant, practice effective and safe hygiene, keep our families and households sanitized, and follow the directives and guidance of the public health officials. Stay healthy. The last item I'm going to share with you is employee transitions. In February, we had one employee begin employment with Golden Lane, Megan Stone. She's a news carrier for the Rushmore News. We had four employees leave employment with Golden Rain in February. Agnes Gao, our accounts payable and accounts receivable specialist. Judith Perkins, our senior manager of human resources. Tanae Tate, a bus driver, and Alexis Williams, a lifeguard. And that's my report. Thank you, Tim. Are there any questions for Tim? Carl. Yes, I would like to thank uh... Tim and Paul for reopening the cardboard recycling. And I imagine that, that they are expecting that all boxes, et cetera, be broken down uh, by the residents beforehand. Correct, Carl. The, um, the recycling facility is open, <clears throat> but it's only allowing one person in at a time. And residents will have to, we're asking residents to break down the boxes and deposit them in the containers. The staff are unable to help. We want to keep, again, that's just to keep, absolutely insist on safe protocols for both the residents and the staff. Yeah, I think that in today's uh, environment where we're having far more deliveries, uh, otherwise we would overload our recycling cans. Okay, any other comments or questions? Uh, since there aren't any, we're going to move to the residence forum, but I see a number of people have joined since uh, Deborah gave instructions. So basically, if you're in the uh, attendee uh, section of the website and you would like to speak during the residence forum, you must enter a comment or a question into the uh, Q&A section at the bottom of your, your screen, and uh, you'll be unmuted when it's your turn to speak. Uh, state your name and address, and uh, you have three. You'll have three minutes. So now we'll move to the residence forum. Uh, Lisa, it's yours. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> Our first resident forum speaker is uh, Diane Snow. Um, Diane, uh, could you, if you can hear me, um, please state your name uh, and Rossmore address, and then you may have three minutes to address the board. Diane, can you hear us okay? Whoops. I think I have her. I'm clicking unmute, but it's not. Hmm. Okay. Um, for some reason, I'm not being allowed. Diane, can you hear us? For some reason, I'm not. I'm not being successful in unmuting her, but I can read her comment aloud to the board as she typed it. Uh, considering that GRF proposes to spend 175, $175,000 without any guarantee that final approval from state or local municipalities is forthcoming, is any of that money recoverable if approval is not granted? Also, considering that 11 to $13 million is the early estimate and benefits won't be realized for approximately 20 years, doesn't that put a lot of financial burden on residents here who probably won't be alive to see the benefit? We have never heard an estimate 
on how much residents coupons will go up to finance this project. Do we have reasonable estimates? How can a waste recycling facility be built in the valley near the golf course with absolute guarantees that there will be no accompanying odors, noise, etc. And finally, if more money is to be spent, shouldn't this issue go out to the community in the form of individual letters to every address? Residents could actually vote yay, nay, after reading a detailed description of the scope and cost of this program. Thank you. Okay, Lisa, we're gonna try to move to the next. Uh, we're not gonna be responding to each comment as we do normally. I mean, we no, don't normally do that in the residence forum. So we've taken it in and hopefully uh, uh, everyone's thinking about that. But uh, if you could move to the next person. Okay, our next, uh, our next resident forum speaker is Milan Morovich. I'm going to try to allow Milan to talk. Good morning. Ah, we can hear you. Perfect. Yes, the system works. Please, uh, good morning, Milan. Please state uh, your name and address, and then you may have three minutes to address the board. My name is Milan Moravec. I live at 3112 Tarmigan, number one. Go ahead with your concerns. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. President and uh, directors. Um, I appreciate the bold action you've taken to protect your employees. That's a, a great move forward. I now would like to address the issue of protecting us, your customers. We're the people who pay for the services offered by your organization. I recommend that during this crisis, the board half decrease the coupon by one half until this crisis ends and that the board search for capital and day-to-day -day expenses that can be delayed or removed. Your obligations are not only to the assets of Golden Rain Foundation, but also to us as customers. We're paying for the service. We're suffering during this time. And I've noted that you've made no special efforts to accommodate us during this crisis. Even the banks are going forward, which is most unusual to hear with ways of helping their customers. Please seriously consider cutting the coupon in half until this crisis ends. Should you need some help on downsizing expenses, let me know. I have a book and I've written a number of articles on things that I have done to help organizations be more effective and help their customers during this difficult time. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much, directors. Thank, you, Mil <laughs> thank you, Milan, for uh, taking the time to address the board. Our next resident forum speaker is Shakti Rose. Uh, Shakti, please state your name and Rossmore address and then um, you may have up to three minutes to address the board. Go ahead if you can hear us. Okay. I unmuted myself. All right, go ahead. Um, I live at 1345 Singingwood Court number three, and I sent in three questions. The first one was the proposed um, water reclamation 
project. I really, if it ha I came to the meeting late, but if it hasn't already been suspended during this period of uncertainty, I would request that that happen. We're having some trouble hearing you. Shakti, are you there? Community during there you all go. isolation. Can you hear me? Uh, we. If you would start your comments again, um, I believe the audio cut out shortly after you began speaking. Could you just read the questions from what I sent? That would I be would fun. be happy to. Okay. Um, Shakti writes. Uh, how is overflowing trash in a mutual handled? I called GRF and was told to call or email a person, Poppy, to inquire and did this with no result. Trash overflowing by Monday, but pickup is not until Thursdays. The second question is, what is the status of proposed water reclamation project? Is it on hold given the current uncertainties? And item number three is, what, if anything, is GRF doing to promote community in light of this massive mandatory isolation? Okay, thank you Shakti for taking the time. Our next uh, resident forum speaker is Pat. Uh, Pat, if you could, um, if you could state your first and last name and uh, your Rossmore address. Uh, and then you may have three minutes to address the board. Hi. There we go. This is Pat Rannigan. I'm on Fairlawn Court, entry five. And my comment was, um, can, can staff who are idle by the virus crisis, such as janitorial staff, uh, be decked against ongoing GRF facilities, deep maintenance, such as carpet cleaning or window washing or identifying clubhouse equipment that needs repair, replacement, etc. cetera. Um, just like in 1989, when the Bay Bridge had fallen down, the, the bridge maintenance supervisor brought in everybody from around the state. And when the bridge reopened, it was, it was a shining jewel. Um, given that we have idle staff time and empty facilities, is this the time where we can go ahead and really polish up and, and bring everything to almost new condition so that when we do reopen, um, we'll have a gorgeous shining facilities. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, our next resident forum speaker is Peter. Peter, if you would be so kind as to state your first and last name, as well as your Rossmore address, and then begin your three minutes. Just a reminder, everyone, you, you need to unmute yourself before you can speak. So go to the bottom of the control panel and unmute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me now? We can hear you, Peter. Yeah, hello, Peter Ramager, um, 2916, apartment 5, Tice Creek Drive. I was just listening earlier to the comments of breaking down boxes and taking to the recycling. Um, I was just remind everybody the virus actually lives on cardboard boxes for a minimum of three days. So it's actually worthwhile leaving those boxes outside before you're breaking down, handle them, and then get somebody else to handle them first. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Peter. Um, let's see. Our next, um, our next speaker is Mariana. Um, Mariana, uh, you are live with the Golden Rain Board. Please go ahead and state your first and last name as well as uh, your Rossmore address. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I'm Mariana Tubman. I'm a new resident at 1156 Running Springs Road um, and have been following the news about the uh, pandemic fairly closely, uh, particularly listening to CNN and how Governor Cuomo is dealing with this, uh, which is very serious right now. Um, and I'm concerned that a lot of people in Rossmore don't really understand the seriousness of the situation and the need for all organizations to really be forward thinking. So I had two specific questions uh, that you guys probably don't have answers for, more like suggestions. Are there any thoughts on changing rules on renting units such as rooms or whole units my thought is there may be more people than usual in hospital leaving vacancies and more people outside of rossmore who may be housing insecure who are losing their housing and more people in rossmore who will have short-term uh, income challenges uh, such as my job, which could be, I don't know how long I can continue getting paid because um, I can't go into work. And they may need to supplement income, at least temporarily. So I wonder if there's been any thoughts about that. I'm still not all that familiar with rules on renting. Um, I'd also like to know, is it possible this is the second question. Is it possible for Rossmore to offer any of its closed facilities as overflow facilities to the hospitals, medical systems, if and when medical systems become overloaded, as we're starting to see in New York City? And I anticipate that will be happening in this state fairly soon. Thank you for taking the time to address the board, Ms. Tubman. And uh, that is, and that was our last uh, resident forum speaker. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you to the residents. Uh, it's a, it's a new system. It's a little awkward. Um, even though we didn't respond specifically to your comments and questions, uh, we we did. We are taking it in and thinking about it, and we will be discussing it. Uh, staff will be discussing it. Uh, the CEO has heard your comments and uh, is taking notes, I'm sure. There were no resident committee uh, meetings, so there are no resident member committee reports. We had one uh, board committee meeting before the shutdown. That was the policy committee. So Ken, do you have a report on that meeting? Yes, uh, we're just continuing to revise policy 604.0 uh, Rossmore media access to include specifically uh, those elections, mutual elections that uh, consist of more than just the candidates. So this is an undergoing um, process that we're still in the middle of and that's, that's all the policies that we're considering at this point. Any questions for Ken? Okay, now we're gonna, we have no unfinished business. We're moving to new business. Uh, Jeff, you have a uh, proposal to discuss with the board. Good morning. Uh, this is a item that was added to the agenda. Uh, we have been uh, staffing the main phone number for Rossmore with uh, some recreation staff. We also have our counseling services answering phones uh, in their office. The many questions that we've been receiving is in regards to food delivery uh, and how do people access uh, that. Uh, we've been trying to provide and gather resources for people so we can distribute information. It's on our website, as Tim had mentioned. But we've also been approached by a few uh, resources or identified a few resources that may uh, be of benefit to many residents. Uh, as you know, Creekside Grill has started uh, service again uh, with curbside pickup and delivery that started yesterday. 
Carrie's Kitchen here at uh, the Redwood Room uh, is proposing to start curbside pickup uh, next week and uh, they will have phone order. Uh, we have a service called Choice Foods that we've identified that has some of the essential items uh, such as eggs and milk and bread and uh, they also have prepackaged meals that they usually provide to schools that are closed at this time. They would like to provide service to the community uh, by setting up a distribution area in the Gateway parking lot. Uh, we also have uh, a few catering services that have contacted us that typically provide service to the community that would like to provide uh, delivery services or again, curbside pickup at Gateway parking lot. Finally, we have uh, talked to the, the folks at GoGo -Go Grandparents who provide our shared ride service. And they also have uh, established a call-in uh, dispatch number for uh, connecting people that don't have access to computers and so forth to place orders for groceries or for online delivery of, of meals from numerous restaurants. Uh, so we're making that information available. The action we're, we're asking you today is really if, if we can allow uh, some of these businesses to utilize the Gateway parking lot to distribute food. And also uh, we have, as I mentioned, staff answering the main line, the, the 988-7700 line to provide basic information and answer questions. Uh, but they also could assist residents that don't have access to uh, technology to, to place orders and so forth. They could be a resource to uh, assist residents in, in doing that or connecting them with resources that can help them do that. Uh, but if there's questions uh, in regards to that. Could you repeat the name of the company that uh, the first one you mentioned was a Choice Foods? Choice Foods, yes. Okay, so questions for Jeff about this. Dale. Uh, Jeff, uh, what would be helpful for all of us is like for the Creekside Grill, for instance, they obviously are going to have a reduced uh, menu. So if somehow it could be published as to what would be available to order uh, for lunch and for dinner, uh, that would help, I think, help, help sales a lot and, and, uh, and help all of us who want to take advantage of that. So part of what we're asking here as well is if we can utilize our, our resources, such as the Rossmore News, Nixle, the Channel 28, and so forth, to publicize these services, uh, at least their websites, uh, phone numbers, and some, some menu items. Uh, for example, Creekside Grill has their, their website that we sent out in a, a Nixle as well as a phone number. Uh, where they have their daily menu available. Uh, and some of these others, we would add to that list and, and send out and, and make sure people are aware of, of these resources. Kathleen? Um, how many, Jeff, how many uh, different companies would be uh, utilizing the Gateway parking lot to do their distribution? Um, I think it's a wonderful idea. You know, like I can get a big order from Safeway, but, um, you know, you run out of milk, you can't keep that for, you know, a month. So uh, for items like that, some of these things in, in Gateway sound like a great idea. How many would there be? So right now we have two, uh, and uh, Carrie's Kitchen would be up and operating two days a week, and then the Choice Foods would be there. Uh, right now, they're proposing four days a week. It depends on you know, the volume of, of orders they receive. So we would spread them out and, and create a kind of a circular pattern where people can drive in, uh, maintain social distancing to receive their order. Uh, it would all be pre-ordered, prepaid type of service. So that right now, it would be two, two different companies, and we would coordinate different areas in the parking lot. 
Okay, so, that sounds good. Would there be um, just drive up and they put them in your car? You wouldn't have to get out. That's correct. Mary. I have a couple of questions. Um, but first, I want to make sure I understand what the GRF employees will be doing. It sounds like they are, in some cases, a middleman, if they're helping people who can't otherwise use technology. Are they going to advise the people how to use technology, or are they actually going to be taking credit card numbers and placing orders? So the, the first preference would be to be distributing information and uh, giving people resources and helping them with phone numbers uh, where they can place their own orders. In, in an event where somebody has no access to technology, we would assist in placing a, a order where we can, or we've now identified a few different options such as the GoGo -Go grandparents where uh, they would have live operators that would help with that as well. So our, our goal is to be uh, a resource, but in some instances, if somebody has zero access to technology and needs assistance, and we can't guide them to another resource, we may help uh, process orders. So I have a concern about that. I, I would like to get a legal opinion about any liability. Uh, being a middleman can be very difficult. So it's almost as if, um, GRF is the contractor hiring subs in that kind of a business and things go wrong. Orders don't get delivered on time, the wrong things delivered, any, the wrong credit card, any, any one of a number of things. So um, I think if we are going to do that, we better think carefully about taking on that liability. And if the legal opinion is it isn't a liability, so be it. Um, I also think that going into this kind of an amenity, and that's what it is, uh, isn't anything that the, it's not defined in our trust, it's not exactly the role we play, but I can, I can waive my issue about that, given the dire circumstances. So here's another question. Um, getting this business up and running is gonna take a while, I assume, and we don't know how long we're going to offer that amenity. Is that right? Because I'm assuming that should we ever get back to how things used to be, the gateway parking lot um, is not a place we'd want to be doing this. So do you have thoughts on that, Jeff? So both Carrie's Kitchen and Choice Foods are ready to uh, begin service next as soon as next week. We, we really have been holding off pending this uh, discussion. So we can send out information to residents pretty much immediately starting today and they would be able to process orders and, and have delivery up and ready uh, for residents starting in the parking lot next week. Uh, the, these are definitely temporary uh, during this, this time of crisis uh, and would cease as soon as you know, this re restrictions are, are lifted. Okay, and then a third concern I had, I'll get off in a minute guys, give you a chance. Um, so uh, Creekside Grill pays a lease fee to GRF. And I'm concerned that in Carrie's Kitchen also, we want Carrie's Kitchen to be successful. And now we are offering additional resources to residents, but at the same time, we're bringing in competitors that could make it even more difficult for Carrie's Kitchen and Creekside Grill. So I think that's a factor we have to consider. So I see other people have questions and I'd like to hear what those are and maybe come back and ask more of mine. Thanks. I just wanna to respond to your last comment, Mary. Choice Foods is not competing with Carrie's Kitchen or Creekside really. I mean, it's like saying Safeway is competing with them. So they're just delivering right. uh, basic foods and people currently can have food delivery program. I think GoGo -Go Grandparent is just a sort of an offering an option that's a little less uh, need in a little less need of technology and that you can call them. So right. we're, we're not really promoting anything that's significantly competing with uh, Creekside and Carries at this point. Okay. So there were some other hands raised. Who, Sue? Um, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, I, I've got Mary's uh, same thing, only I'd like to be sure that if we're going to offer these two that we don't 
that we restrict it to just two people. I like the parking lot doesn't need to be filled with all kinds of different, you know, people out there giving out eggs and cheese that we only allow these two, for instance, but put a lid on, on how many are going to be in the gateway parking lot. I think they were only talking about one, actually. Uh, I assume GoGo -Go Grandparent would deliver to your door as they do with their transportation service, but maybe I'm wrong, Jeff, are you? So GoGo -Go Grandparent is basically, they utilize all of the other services such as Grubhub and, and so forth. They don't actually provide the service themselves. They're, they're kind of a, a middleman. Uh, right now we're talking about Carrie's Kitchen providing uh, service, curbside service, utilizing the parking lot as well as uh, Choice Pantry. So two. Okay, other Dale and then Kathleen. Jeff, I'm wondering if uh, the grill would be interested in also doing curbside service out in the parking lot. I know that they're uh, uh, proposed to do it in the vicinity of the uh, of the grill, but uh, I'm wondering if they would be interested in setting up out in the parking lot. So these are all pre-ordered uh, services. This isn't something that somebody can just drive up and receive. It's all pre-ordered. And Creekside Grill has a place set up for curbside pickup that is in close proximity to the restaurant. I don't think they would want to bring food all the way down to the Creekside or to the parking lot here at Gateway to distribute. Um, they're, they're probably better set up right near the restaurant. Okay, Kathleen. Um, well, I share Mary's concern about um, a middleman placing orders like taking people's credit card numbers. So, um, and another option would be to give the people information and then have a friend or a family member, or, you know, it doesn't have to be somebody local. It can be just someone else um, where, where uh, we wouldn't be uh, in the middle and therefore possibly liable. But if we give them information, give them numbers and then and they can have, uh, and they can call a friend or a relative to actually place the order. Since the, this item was drafted and, and sent out, we, we identified the, the GoGo -Go grandparents as uh, they've expanded their service in, in order to pick up the restaurant delivery as well as grocery shopping delivery. Uh, so if people need assistance and want to talk to a live person, we can point them in that direction and they can process and place orders. Our staff can simply be the uh, resource and, and we can utilize our various uh, amenities such as the, the Rossmore News and, and Nixle to get the information out. But as far as placing orders, we can refer those people directly to GoGo. -Go who has live operators that can help people without technology. That sounds that good. That way we're, we're not actually taking credit card orders. Yeah, that sounds great. Any other questions? Mary. Um, Jeff, I wondered if um, when our employees are offering this advice, are they able to do that from home or is this something that requires them to come to the office? Right now we have two staff coming in uh, and they're answering the phones uh, at, at uh, Gateway here. We are looking into being able to forward that phone number to multiple people that may be at, at home, uh, but we haven't done that as of yet. So right now there, there's two coming into the office. They are maintaining appropriate distancing and so forth. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, Carl. If you can find a distributor for toilet paper and paper towels and hand sanitizer, they're welcome to. Okay, other comments? So you're looking for a motion. I take it that we would uh, authorize uh, GRF to proceed with um, allowing pickup from Choice Foods and Carrie's Kitchen in the Gateway parking lot. Uh, is that 
updated and that the employees won't be handling credit cards or placing orders for residents. That's correct. Doesn't okay. this include go go grandparents? That's really just a service that we would refer. Is there anything we need to do? To? You, you oh. don't need to include that in your motion. Kathleen. Uh, I'll make the motion that uh, um, the board authorize Cary Kitchen and Choice Foods to uh, have a curbside delivery uh, of pre-ordered food uh, from the Gateway parking lot. Second. Dale. I, I was going to second it, but Sue Sue mentioned a second. Either way, either one. Okay. Any discussion? I guess the one thing that uh, we didn't really completely discuss is there's been some concern about uh, people in general. So I assume uh, Carrie's Kitchen already has access to Rossmore, obviously, but Choice Foods. So they'll be bringing a truck in one or two days a week and then um, uh, go to the Gateway parking lot and then leave. That's correct. Uh, we would make sure they had uh, appropriate lists of uh, those coming in at the gates and they would be coming to Gateway Park lot to distribute. Okay, Barbara. Do we need to include in the uh, motion, the part about staff uh, helping with um, limited access to uh, residents with limited access to technology? I think that should be separate. Me too. So what yes, we've said, I agree. It should be separate. So what we've said is that uh, since since this uh, report was issued, we've identified the GoGo -Go grandparent option. So uh, our staffing, GRF staffing, will answer questions, provide resource information, and so forth, like we've been doing. But anybody that needs to actually place an order and need help placing an order, we would refer them to uh, GoGo. -Go. So I don't, I don't think you need to include that portion in your your motion. Okay. So all in favor of the motion? Um, well, we're going to do a roll call vote. That's what we decided. So Deborah, if you could call off the. Uh, the names and say yay or nay. Deborah, you're on mute. <laughs> that would help if you can hear me. Kelso. Yay. Coonan. Yay. Birdsaw. Yay. Neff. Yay. Adams. Yay. Anderson. Yay. Brown. Yay. Harrington. Yay. Stumpfell. Yes. Okay, motion passes. I want to remind people of Kathleen's suggestion. Uh, instead of finding the little icon and uh, clicking it and then unclicking it, if you just hold down the space bar on your computer, it will unmute for that length of time that you're holding it down. It makes it easy to do things like that. Uh, now I'd like to call on Eric to give us a uh, an informational presentation about um, some of the things going on in HR. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, you know, an important part of HR practice focuses on the performance the functioning and well-being of our employees. And I have personally been encouraged uh, and inspired by our employees balancing some of the personal needs they've had throughout this crisis. And while engaging in work, um, you see the spirit of those who are committed to what they do and they're interested in being part of the solution. So I'd like to take the opportunity just to share some information about the different federal and state programs that are being made available to support employees um, who are impacted directly or indirectly by COVID-19. Uh, the purpose of this discussion is to provide the board with information that will help to understand these benefit programs uh, provisions 
or gaps in relation to employee normal earnings uh, and insights into the potential impact on GRF staff if the requirement of shelter in place and service cutbacks continues beyond the 7th or the health of our employees and their families are impacted personally by COVID-19. I, I should probably add as well too is that the information I share applies to residents who are also working that are facing these same issues with their employers. Uh, and so hopefully this information will help. Um, I'll direct you to the um, document 10V1 and 2. And what I'd like to do is to start off with um, actually on the second page, if I can share that. Okay, can you all see the PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Yes. Great. I'm impressed. Yes. <laughs> it's working. <laughs> um, and actually, instead of um, the first page, I'd like to start out on page two, which addresses the federal benefits, because if um, employees or when employees begin to uh, utilize their benefits. They're going to start at the top. They're going to want to start at the federal level and move down to the benefits that are offered through the state of California. Um, so first of all, uh, those passed the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, or FFCRA. So the FFCRA was enacted to assist employees affected by COVID-19 outbreaks with job-protected leave um, and emergency paid sick leave. The FFCRA actually is composed of two different parts. One is an expansion um, of FMLA, which is called the emergency FMLA. And what that does is that it enhances the benefits of job protected leave uh, that are currently under the FMLA programs that, that exist today. Um, and then the second part, our counterpart to that is the emergency paid sick leave program, which is intended to provide immediate relief for employees who are impacted by the COVID-19 virus, either for themselves or for qualified family members. So if you look at this grid here, the first is emergency paid leave for self. So under this program, employees who are personally impacted by COVID-19 are able to remain whole in their wages uh, for the first two weeks uh, under emergency paid leave without the loss of normal wages. However, after two weeks, there's a potential for a wage gap between any disability or, or unemployment benefits that they might be able to have access to. Um, and then, that, and then also the gap exists that they don't have vacation or sick leave that they're able to, um, um, to use as well. Now, for emergency paid sick, uh, sick leave for self, the qualifiers are an employee subject to federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation. Um, they're advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine due to concerns related to COVID-19, or they're experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 and they're seeking medical diagnosis and support of that. The second part is for emergency paid leave for a child or family member. So the employees will, but they're having to attend to a family member or a sick child. Um, and under that, um, they can receive up to $200 per day. However, the difference between uh, emergency paid leave for family members is that they're capped at two thirds of their salary. $200 are two thirds of their normal wages. Under the first one for their selves, up to $511, uh, uh, $511 per day um, and it's meant to keep them whole. So there is a slight gap there. And then the third category is emergency family medical leave. That's for employees needing to stay at home because their child school has been closed. Uh, in that case, they can receive up to $200 to, uh, per day, which begins at week three through 12. So there is a kind of a supporting balance there. So uh, for an employee who has a child at home because the school closes, they have the first two weeks where they can access emergency paid sick leave at $200 a day, and then beginning with week three up to week 12, then emergency uh, family medical leave kicks in and it provides them with that same benefit at $200 a day. Um, I guess a more exact definition of that, of emergency FMLA is, um, EFMLA provides up to 12 weeks of protected leave to an employee who is unable to work or telework to care for their child under 18 years of age, if the child's school or their place of care is closed, or the child care provider is unavailable due to public health emergencies. So it's not just for those who have children in schools, it's if they have daycare um, support or they have a, um, a child care giver and they're unable to work because of um, the uh, emergency response and needs right now, they, if they can't provide those services, then this benefit is being made available for them. 
Okay, so let's go to the next slide, and I can talk a little bit about the California programs. Oops. All right, there we go. Oh, and just a note, under the federal programs, uh, ultimately, the government will pick up the tab on that, and that'll be recognized through different payroll tax credits that they'll get um, uh, that are filed on a quarterly basis. Um, and just another note, under the federal program, everything that they've approved is set to expire at the end of the year, so it's not intended to go beyond this current year. There are some other things that are going on if you're following the news, the new federal stimulus, stimulus bill, which is separate from this, but there are some other benefits with that that can help employees. Um, that would provide from the government immediate relief through $1,200 to single Americans, $2,400 to um, couples, and for parents who have children under the age of 17, they would receive a check of $500 per child. So there are some other um, fine lines with that. Payments would diminish for those with a gross income of $75,000 or more, up to $99,000. And if you're making $99,000 and above, then you wouldn't be eligible for those benefits. So now the California programs, once those have been exhausted, there are a few things that California has in place that employees could access. One of the things that Governor Newsom did at the start of this was to waive the one week waiting period. So generally for each of the programs listed here, there would be a one week uh, no pay period and then benefits would kick in. So if employees apply and qualify, they would begin to receive benefits immediately beginning week one. And again, these benefits would come after federal. So under California state disability, it provides continuing paid benefits after two weeks of federal leave. It covers roughly 60 to 70% of salary up to $1,300 per week for 52 weeks, for up to 52 weeks. Uh, employees who need to take uh, leave to care for family members can use or apply for paid family leave um, for similar wage benefits, but they're capped at six weeks for this benefit. Um, if employees lose their jobs due to downsizing, and a lot of employers are going through that now, is that they can apply for unemployment insurance and even if they're furloughed and wages are reduced because there's lack of work, they can apply for unemployment as, as a partial remedy to this. Um, we tossed around the terms here of uh, furloughed and layoffs, and you'll, you'll find that out there in, in, with employers. Um, a furlough is an employee who is temporarily uh, not able to work, but the expectation is that they're going to be able to come back at some point when things uh, become normal. A layoff is when an employee is, is actually terminated from an employer's payroll. So employees can apply for unemployment insurance benefits um, even if their uh, paid family leave um, benefits have been exhausted. So as I mentioned, if you're caring for a family member, you're only allowed under California programs up to six weeks. But if there's a need to continue on, if the, serious, if the health um, concern is serious enough, they, uh, an employee can apply for unemployment insurance to see if they qualify for additional benefits beyond the six weeks. Uh, UI benefits are generally determined by the previous four quarters of base earnings, whether that be here um, or if an employee is new and they had worked at a previous employer, they would look at previous employer earnings as well. So it's not really geared towards a percentage of salary, but what their earnings are. Uh, the cap is at 11700 um, If you do calculations on that, it's, it's minimum. It really actually comes out to less on an hourly rate, less than minimum wage for California. Um, so employees can receive benefits under one program at a time, but they can also switch from one to another. So let's say an employee is receiving benefits because they're caring for a family member, a family member under paid family leave. Um, and during the course of that, they contract COVID-19 themselves. Then they could submit an application to California State Disability and be eligible for those benefits up to 52 weeks since um, it now qualifies or applies to them. You know, it's important for my team to stay in touch with employee concerns. And we've gotten feedback. We've had different questions from employees. And I, I thought it's important just to share, you know, where they're at right now, how, how is staff doing. And, and their concerns really come down to three areas. The first is really family and workplace concerns. Um, they're concerned about children who are impacted by the school closings. And they're wondering what that may mean for them if it continues on past April 7th, or however long the state determines that state, or the county should determine how, how long the school should be closed. Um, 
some employees have expressed concern about coming into the office. Um, it's interesting, age is not really the factor. I know that we've taken precautions for those who are at sensitive ages, but you really can't put a number to that. You can't say at 65 or 50 or 70 or 80. I, I know individuals like my mom who is as healthy as a horse and she's, she's well into her years. And so as an employer, you know, in those circumstances, we give employees a choice of it's an essential services uh, role, uh, but we let employees make determinations on that. The real concerns about health uh, workplace safety for employees is um, because there's so many loopholes with this, if you haven't been tested and you don't know if you have the virus or not, even if you're not exhi exhibiting symptoms, you could still be a carrier. So employee concerns have been around the areas of um, would they be exposed if they came back and would they bring the virus back to a family member? Um, the second area of concerns are really around wage and benefits. Um, they're a concern about their ability to work after April 7th um, when the order is up. Um, they've asked, you know, will there be any support for them beyond the 7th and for how long? Uh, related to that, employees are concerned about how they continue to live, if their wages are reduced um, by the federal and state programs because there's a gap there. Um, they are concerned, have concerns about sick and vacation leave, that they have to use that and then the availability for sick um, or vacation later on if another need arises outside of the COVID-19 um, concerns. Uh, and then they're concerned about health care uh, benefits continuation. There are certain rules that are applied to employers about how long benefits can continue if they're not able to work um, and they're furloughed. And then the third area of concerns really is along the programs that I just explained here about the federal and state programs. It can be very confusing and there are different uh, benefits depending on your situation. Um, but for that, that's one of the roles that we have in HR is to help employees to navigate the questions that they may have in these programs, what might be right for them, directing to the right links and sources, providing forms for them. So um, my team here will be doing a lot with that, I think, as things continue to go on or they persist. Um, and then lastly, let me get to this slide. So others, there's not a lot of clear decisions um, because things are constantly changing and moving. Um, from what we do know, you know, there are benefits available. So for employees that are exposed or they believe they've been exposed, uh, the federal government has provided benefits for two weeks. And so the idea of having that self-quarantine period, that'll be covered um, by the government um, effective April 2nd. Um, for employees, you know, life goes on. There may be reasons not related to COVID-19 at all. Employees who may you want to take time off, vacation sick. So the policies that we have in place under sick pay and vacation are still set. So if it's for non-illness or personal reasons, those are still available for employees. I think the area that we'll need to have more discussion as more information is given is for employees that are unable to work because of illness-related uh, reasons. Uh, we know what the state and federal programs are going to offer but we don't know what that means in terms of how to, to help employees if, if, if there's anything at all. So those questions I feel, still think need to be discussed um, as, um, as we find out more information. Um, does anyone have any uh, questions for me? So Eric, if you could remove the um, uh, PowerPoint, then we could go back and I could see everyone's uh, face and they could raise hands. Okay, any questions for Eric on that? Thank you, Eric. Okay, Mary. Uh, Eric, on the last chart, the recommended actions, unable to work due to illness, is that any illness? Well, what I've spoken about here and the benefits are geared towards COVID-19. The federal benefits are geared specifically for COVID-19. Um, So in that case, if an employee were ill for other reasons, they would still have the state disability programs and they could access them in the same way. There would still be a gap there. But I think for our thinking is, is, what, is what are we doing related to the current concerns of how we're impacted by COVID-19? So what I'm not understanding is the recommendation to supplement um, the benefits and to keep people, keep employees whole. And it is this saying, this is a recommendation if an employee gets COVID-19 and can't out work and they exhaust their benefits, then, then GRF would uh, keep them whole. 
expecting to come back to work at some point when things get back to normal? Yes, the discussion would be around if employees exhaust the state disability, federal disability, and their vacation sick leave pay, and that gap there. But all this really is in thinking about what the impact is because of COVID-19, not okay. because of other, because there are so many other reasons right. why a person could get sick. This really addresses our current needs that Stress we're all facing. Would be one of them. So just, just to be clear, we're not discussing that at this point. I think he's just talking, thinking in the future. So at this right. point, we're not going to be addressing uh, anything beyond April 7th. So are there questions, other questions for Eric, uh, Carl, and then Kathleen? Yes, I'm wondering if, in fact, they're eligible, uh, can we, can the employees receive these benefits and GRF provide the difference? Or if we provide uh, financial support to people that are on furlough, uh, does that preclude federal assistance? So, Carl, just, just, we didn't hear the first part of your question. But I think at this point, we have agreed to supplement or to pay people in full, keep them whole until April 7th. And we're not really making any decisions or making any uh, plans for beyond that time. Well, my, my question was, if in fact they're eligible for federal or state benefits, can they receive these benefits and GRF provide the difference to make them whole? Eric? I think that's part of the discussion that the board would have to have if, if there is anything beyond April 7th. So Kathleen? Well, my question is, uh, I don't know if uh, Eric can answer this, um, but it's something I've wondered about the federal. So they talk about um, sending out checks to everyone. And this would, this would include everyone in Rossmore who fell into the right um, categories. And so they keep talking about up to $75,000 uh, income and up to $99,000 income. But they never say, is that for an individual? What if you are a couple? So, um, you know, is your income doubled or is that, you know, if you earn more than 99 as a couple, you're out? Sure, the, the terms of that as I read it are it's $1,200 from the government for individuals. And if you're married, then you would receive $2,400. And the thresholds are that if you're making $75,000 up to 99,000, the amounts of the $1,200 would decrease and if you're making $99,000 or more, then you wouldn't be eligible to receive that check. And if you're, if you're married, those amounts are doubled. So um, for if you're, if you're eligible for the $2,400 $2, as a married couple, that threshold is $150,000 up to $198,000. So it decreases at $150,000 up to $198,000. Okay. And if and you're making as a couple, if your income as a couple is $198,000 or more, then you wouldn't be eligible for the $2,400. Okay. And they're taking that from last year's income tax? Um, if 2009, they said if 2019 is available, otherwise they'll go to 2018. So, uh, Eric, is there anyone currently in Rossmore, since we're paying everybody, keeping them whole until April 7th, my assumption is that none of those specific uh, COVID-19 provisions or state, uh, I guess, what, is any employee on any of those programs since they're being paid by GRF at this point through April 7th? No, and that's a good question is that the, the benefits um, are not, uh, um, the, the effective date is that is for April 2nd, but if, the, if your company has put other benefit provisions in place, it does not get reduced by the federal program. So for our employees, if they applied now, it wouldn't matter because they would take a look that they're receiving, they're being kept whole and they wouldn't be eligible for that. So I anticipate that depending on what happens, if we continue on after April 7th, then we would see uh, a need for employees to begin applying for these programs. Any other questions for Eric? Thank you, Eric. I know we'll be talking soon. So. Okay. Thank you, everyone.
unmute. Um, item 10C, Jeff, uh, you're going to present on this. Yes, so uh, if you'll recall a few months ago when we had the discussion on the discretionary capital fund, one of the items was continuation of the uh, satellite wastewater recycle facility. And we presented that really as a, a four year term um, with year one being 175,000 that was uh, approved. The scope of that work is included in your packet with Brezac and Associates. And it basically in includes further development of the, the project uh, definition so we can uh, begin work on the CEQA documents that would be required. Uh, CEQA, I, I heard an earlier question in regards to, you know, smell and noise and that sort of thing. The CEQA documents is what really addresses those for the, the public uh, and it involves work with uh, government agencies, regulatory agencies such as the city and, and um, the water district and sewer district. In light of you know, what's going on, certainly this item can be postponed. Uh, it is, uh, again, we, we presented it as a four-year scope of work uh, with the facility actually being in construction and uh, almost ready to operate by the end of that four years. Uh, we are uh, concerned about future droughts and the, the need for this facility as it's, it's really designed to be an insurance policy to, to keep uh, both the golf course green for a variety of reasons, as we've discussed uh, over the, the history of this project. Uh, but it is one that uh, if the board would like to postpone can be. Uh, but if you would like to proceed, uh, this is what the scope of work with Brezac would be. And we would begin work uh, once, once it's approved. Thank you, Mary. I, I uh, wanted to uh, make a couple of comments. I want to start with an email that I received from a resident in my district. I just wanted to share my individual opinion that GRF should be shepherding all resources in these uncertain times. To me, it would be prudent to put a hold on all capital expenditures unless items are an emergency. Just my opinion as a resident of my, as a resident to my district H representative. And after, um, I, so, so the water reclamation project is certainly long-term, very expensive, and the weather may or may not cooperate. So I understand that deferring this for a long time could mean that we end up having severe droughts before we ever get to where we want to be. But I think uh, in light of what is going on, we should not approve this today. We need to go back and look at our capital projects. We need to remove some of them. Uh, this may or may, may, may or may not make the cut. Something may happen three days from now where we don't want to do anything. Uh, but cutting capital budgets is going on in all sorts of organizations across the world, actually. And so my, my vote is to not approve this defer it, we can talk about it again at our next meeting, depending on how far we are and what progress we've made on decisions around capital funding. So I don't know how the rest of you feel. Carl? Yes, I think the other thing we need to consider is that if a lot of these agencies are working from home, it may actually take more effort to shepherd these organizations through their approval process and as a consequence in the long run cost us more than it would be once these governmental agencies are back to functioning normally. Sue? I um, I think that I agree totally with Mary. I think we ought to, you know, set this back and take a good look at all the capital improvements right now. So I really think we ought to just put this off right now. Kathleen and then Dale. Uh, well, um, I agree, but I would like to ask Jeff, um, if we put off this decision for a few months, uh, what would be the consequences? Would it put us back a year? Is there a, a time thing where it has to happen to, you know, um, uh, 
shortly or would a six month or a three month or a four month delay and what consequences would there be? We would have a, a few options. One, we designed this over a four year period to try and, and spread out the cost. We could accelerate if we wanted to start in six months and just condense what's remaining to be done uh, into a shorter period of time. Or we could just spread it out from that point on again for a, a four year period, but just starting six months from now. So we have a lot of options on, on how we can do that. Uh, I don't think it'll impact the, the overall cost, uh, really what we're looking at, uh, but it, it would probably be prudent to delay and make those decisions at a later point. Dale and then Les. Um, yes, I I'm agree with Mary, and I believe that we should delay, but I also believe that maybe we can do it in such a way that we we reevaluate each month, month by month at our meetings. That way, if things change, we've got it scheduled to, to be dealt with at a board meeting, and we can take action at that point. Les? Well, I, <clears throat> I'm very sad about uh, trying to slow down this project, as you know. Um, but uh, as long as we keep focused on the end result, uh, delaying it at this particular point will not be bad. But let's not lose sight of this project. It's essential for Rossmore. So um, question for Deborah and Tim. If we just don't, excuse me, if we just don't pass anything, don't have a motion and don't pass, is that adequate or do we need to have a motion to delay this or to not approve this? Yes, um, the way the agenda is written, it's an actionable item. So you would need to uh, make a motion to table to a future date or indefinitely table. Okay, can I have a motion, Carl? I move that we table this to another date, uh, probably three months on out. Is there a second? I second it. Discussion on that? Um, this is uh, Kathleen, then Mary. Um, I think we can just table it um, for a future future discussion. I don't need think we need to say in three months. Um, you know we might decide something in two months, depending. The second agrees. Mary? I was gonna say the same thing. I, um, don't, don't, don't say the three months, just make the motion to table. So does that uh, mean that Point we need order. to amend the motion with a, an amendment? Point of order, Mr. President. Ken? I'd like to ask Deborah if can a table motion extend beyond one month or does or does the uh, rules prohibit that? So you can table um, to the next month, uh, but if items, I mean, ultimately you can bring forth this item at any point in time as an actionable agenda item. You can keep tabling it um, after uh, the three months. Um, you can address it at the three month point. You can actually address it earlier to the three-month point. Carl? Yeah, I think I mentioned three months so that uh, we bring this up to discuss and either retable or not, but at least it goes back on the agenda to review and we can continue. And as Deborah says, that if we decide we want to, do, to implement it earlier, it's my understanding that we can bring it up and and act act on it in less than three months it's so desired it's just that we probably at some point ought to set a specific time to say you know let's look at this again and see where we are less would there be a problem if we uh, just tabled it and then make sure it's on the agenda every month? Well, it seems like sort of a potential unnecessary 
to make it on the agenda every month. It sounds like we can do whatever we want. So if things get back to normal, um, we'll be certain to put this back on. I don't think it's gonna fall off anyone's radar. So rather than go through the motion of amending the motion, let's just vote on this. And if in two months, everything's back to normal, we'll put it back on the agenda at our agenda meeting. So if that's okay with everyone, any other questions or comments? So we'll do a roll call vote on the motion to table, but for three months, but realizing we can bring it up anytime we want. Kelso? Yes. Birdsong? Yes. Kunin? Yes. Neff? Yes. Adams? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Stumpfell? Yes. Okay, motion passes unanimously. That's the end of our agenda. Um, next month, mid-month regular meeting of the board will be held on Tuesday, April 14th uh, at 9 a.m. Probably not at Peacock Hall, but if possible at Peacock Hall, otherwise it'll be another Zoom meeting. Uh, the next end of month regular meeting of the board will be held on Thursday, April 30th, uh, possibly in Peacock Hall and possibly on Zoom. Uh, there's no executive session today, so we are adjourned and thanks everybody for getting through this. I think it went pretty well, considering it's our first time. So again, thank you, Deborah and Lisa and Joe and everybody.